I got my undergraduate degree here, um, graduated in 1993, so we'll pause to let you figure out how old that makes me. And then I'm currently in the middle of the Master's of Science and Analytics program, so I'm the true definition of teaching an old jacket new tricks. When I got invited to speak here, I was, I was very excited. Um, you know, the chance as an alumnus and as a current student to be able to speak to everybody. And I started asking around to my colleagues. I said, what will the students be most interested in hearing from? And I got a variety of responses. Um, they want personal stories about your academic journey, uh, entering the workforce. They want to hear about what we're doing um, at AT&T today. But the word I kept coming back to was perspective. Um, they want to hear your perspective. And I kept thinking about that word, and I thought the importance that perspective has played for me through my educational journey, my career journey, and actually giving perspective is what we do in my team at at and So let's start out by looking at the definition of perspective. Um, just to read it real quick, the art of representing three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional surface so as to give the right impression of their height, width, depth, and position in relation to each other. A particular attitude towards or way of regarding something, a point of view. Perspective makes things real. So if you have perspective, you can understand things and make things real. All right? So let's get into the talk with a couple of stories. So let me take you back to the year 1990. 1990 was an incredible time here at Georgia Tech. The Rolling Stones had just played a concert at the football stadium, one of the most electric nights on campus that I experienced. Atlanta had just been named the host city for the 1996 Olympics, and Georgia Tech named the Olympic Village. So the campus was about to undergo a tremendous transformation. Our basketball team had just come off of a Final Four run. Our football team was in the midst of their national championship season. And I was a sophomore physics major, about to take my second course in my major. I had just finished particle dynamics. I did pretty well in it. And I was taking electromagnetics, or as we call it, EMAG, right? Not only was I taking it, I was failing it in spectacular fashion. All right, that, that five means that's a five-hour course. That's five hours of F, all right? And I don't know if any of you have ever brought home a five-hour F, but your parents usually want to know why, okay? And I knew exactly why I got that F, and I told my father directly. The reason was written dining hall, you see? I had the bright idea to take all my classes early in the day, because like I said, campus was a lot of fun then, and if I took my classes early, I had the rest of the day to enjoy all the campus had to offer. And every morning, I would get up for that 8 a.m. physics class, five hours, Monday through Friday, one hour every day, and I had to walk past Britain Dining Hall. And as I walked past Britain Dining Hall, I could smell French toast. And I had to make the choice between physics or French toast, and I will sheepishly admit, French toast won out way more than it should. So that was the reason. So yeah, I was a physics major, so I had to take it again, right? So what's it called when you take EMAG a second time? REMAG, right? <laughs> so at my father's advice, I took it at 10 a.m., free from the threat of French toast, not quite into the danger zone of lunch, and failing it in spectacular fashion a second time. So. Um, so what do we call it when you take EMAG a third time? Three mag. So I was left with a choice. Do I three mag or do I change majors? And I changed majors. Um, there was a, a, brand new, a brand new major being offered at the time called Science, Technology, and Culture. It's now called Literature, Communication, and Media. Um, uh, it was brand new. I was one of the first few students in the program, and I excelled in it. Um, coursework in computer science. Math, science, literature, history, management, all of them, and I did great. And I actually graduated on time, um, which is saying something, because you saw I had 10 hours of F, and in another presentation, I'll tell you about my five-hour F and differential equations. Um, but I graduated on time. But I had to think about that coursework, that, that second course, and why I, was fail why I failed electromagnetics, and why I did so good in the other courses. You know, I did good in the first physics courses, and then I did bad in electromagnetism. And the reason was, particle dynamics made sense to me. I had experienced acceleration. I could see tensile strength in action. I knew what centrifugal force did. I didn't understand electromagnetics. When I got into these other courses, 
I had perspective in those courses. But because electromagnetics was just theory to me, I did not have that perspective to understand what was going on with it. So as I looked back at Ready for Graduation and looked back on my educational journey, say, why was I successful in some classes and not in others? It was because I had that perspective. Um, we'll jump ahead before I come back to the other story, but I got my master's degree 10 years after my bachelor's at Mercer, and my master's degree was easy because unlike my undergraduate where I was learning about things I was going to experience in the real world, your master's program was telling me about things I had experienced or already had perspective. But coming back to my graduation, um, in the uh, spring of 1993, I graduated along with a good friend of mine who lived on my dorm hall. His name was Bill. And Bill was a management major. Um, the economy in 1993 and the job market was not great. And the best job offer that Bill got was from Waffle House, as a manager of Waffle House. Now, Waffle House hires a lot of managers from Georgia Tech. And Waffle House is an amazing company to work for. But they have some very specific management strategies. One, they believe in homegrown management. So you, everybody starts out as a unit manager, and then you quickly work your way up to a region and a district manager. But the other management philosophy that they have that makes Waffle House so unique is everybody, every leader, no matter what level of the organization you're at, has to spend some time working in a store. So from those area managers to region to district to the C-level suite, you have to spend some time working that griddle. And a couple months after graduation, I called Bill, and I said, hey, Bill, how's work going? And he said, it's going all right. And I remember his exact quote. He said, John, I just didn't think when I graduated from Georgia Tech, I would come home from work smelling like syrup. And you know, I was like, yeah, man, you shouldn't have to do that. You graduated from Georgia Tech. Um, Bill didn't understand the value of it then. Dr. Orso just said, to be a good leader, you have to have empathy for the people in your organization. I think Waffle House instills that empathy by having you work on the front line, understanding what's going on. So that perspective is important. I didn't understand that in 1993. I understand it now. When I walk into an AT&T store to buy a new phone or an accessory or have an issue with my price plan or something, I take note of what's going on in that store. I watch the customer service rep enter the data. That data is being created, and that data is going to come to my team, and we're going to do something with it. It makes it real to see that data being created. When I watch television, I see an AT&T commercial for a promotional offer that my team is providing the data for, it makes it even more real because I have that perspective. So perspective is super important, both in, in your educational journey right now, and then I will we'll stress the importance of having perspective as you move on into your careers. So let me pivot the talk a little bit now and talk about what I do at AT&T um, in terms of perspective. So, I work in the chief data office. I run a team called Data Products and Asset Management. We create, curate, and provision data products across AT&T. So the first question everybody asks is, what's a data product? And I like to define a data product. We'll start in terms of a, a brick and mortar product. Um, this is actually a definition that I learned at Georgia Tech from my favorite professor, Dr. Philip Adler, who was a legend on campus back then. Um, and he pounded this into our head. A product is goods and services in some combination to meet a need or a want. Notice that's goods and services. So as you think about products, the phone in your pocket, the shoes on your feet, the French toast at Britain Dining Hall, they are a combination of goods and services. Uh, just having a pocket full of circuits and a camera and a battery and a screen does you no good. If you don't have that service to put the glue and the shoe and the leather and the laces and all together, it doesn't meet your need or a want. And if I went to Britain Dining Hall and they just handed me uncooked bread, milk, and eggs, I would not be happy. Probably would have attended electromagnetics a lot more often, but I would not have been happy. Um, so a, a data product is data and curation in some combination to beat a business need. Data without curation doesn't have any value. Raw, uncurated data has no value. How many of you have ever heard the term data is the new oil? How many of you have bought unrefined oil lately? Right, so it, you know, the same thing with data. Unrefined, uncurated data does no good. So what we do is we take that raw, uncurated data and we make it consumable to be the business new. Now, what we have here is referred to as the knowledge pyramid. Some of you may be familiar with it. 
And what it is is the evolution of how data evolves from, from data, raw data, into information, into knowledge, into wisdom. My team actually moves data along this path. And at each step, we add more value to that data. It becomes more and more valuable. At the bottom, data is just bytes and bits. It's words and numbers, you know, sentences. It, it just it has no value on standing alone, just as a raw, uncurated form. But my team of data product engineers takes and gives that data context. We know this set of data is a table of account information, and that first column is an account number, and the second column is your billing name, and the third column is the address, and the fourth column is your activation day, and then the fifth column is um, your, uh, uh, your status code. All of that context makes that data usable. Once we add that technical metadata to it and define the data, it has some value. That data is now information. But that, my team's not done there. So my team of designers will then take that information and instill meaning into it. So from that account table, we can find out what your average monthly bill is. We can look at other information to see how many times you've visited an AT&T store, how many times you've you know, visited um, other companies' websites, what's the likelihood that you're going to churn. So through this information, we can start answering questions that start with words like, how much, how many, how long, right? That data is now knowledge, but we don't stop there. It's already a lot more valuable than it was at the information stage, but we don't stop there. This is where the data science team comes in, and they instill insight into that data. So now we can take that information and say, you know, we know that the customer's average monthly bill is increasing. What's the root cause of that? Um, we know that we're having a higher churn in this demographics, what's the cause? So we take those how much, how many, how long questions, and we answer why, how come, and what if. But let's look at those three words that my team instills in the data to add knowledge to it, context, meaning, and insight. Those are all different words for perspective. Right? So when I started thinking about this topic, I said, well, perspective, that's what we do. This will be easy. So. Um, so let's go back to that original definition of perspective, right? The art of representing a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional surface so as to give the right impression of their height, width, depth, and position in relation to each other. A particular attitude towards or way of regarding something. And let's turn that into a definition for data perspective, right? The art of representing raw data in a consumable manner so as to give the right impression of its context, meaning, and insight, a particular attitude store of way regarding data. As I conclude today, um, I, I want to leave you with these words. I want to encourage you guys to start looking for that perspective. Um, thinking how perspective can help you in your education. I want you to take this into your careers and understand the importance of having a perspective, not just your own, but the perspective within your organization and the way that we give perspective. So I want you to look for it, seek it. When you do find it, embrace it and appreciate it. Even if it means you might come home from work smelling like syrup. <laughs>